So this thing is a magnetic levitator. It makes this, which has a magnet inside of it, uh, float, suspended right about there underneath the coil. So I think that anything that can levitate an object is pretty cool. Um, probably the first example I saw was the Bernoulli ping pong ball over the hairdryer trick, which if you haven't seen before you should go look it up because it's cool. But uh, whereas that uses a hairdryer, so it's pretty noisy and there's a lot of moving air, this thing uses magnets. So it's completely silent and uh, levitates anything you want to put in it that has a small magnet in it. So it's like the perfect physics desk toy. And in this video I'm going to show you how this one works and how I built it. So the tricky thing about levitation is that you need to be able to counter gravity's forces exactly. If you have too much force on the object trying to lift it up, it's going to accelerate upwards and if you have and eventually hit whatever is lifting it. And if you have too little force on it, it's just going to fall down. Um, magnets are pretty tricky because if you just take two magnets and uh, try to suspend one with the other, it is impossible because if the magnets are too far apart, this is going to fall, and if the magnets are too close together, it's going to adhere because the force that two magnets exert on each other goes up as the distance between them gets smaller. So at some point, right, uh, right in here somewhere, is where the magnetic force is exactly equal to the gravitational force. The problem is that that's only one specific spot in space. It would be nice if there were like a range of areas where it would stabilize itself, which is what the levitator actually does. It effectively can turn this top magnet on and off really quickly, so that when this gets too close, it turns it off and it falls, and when this gets too far away, it turns the magnet on and it attracts it back up. So it actually builds a small area of stability where if it's between two distances then it will eventually come to rest. When you run an electric current through a wire it makes a magnetic field around that wire but the field is all curved up and pretty useless for levitating anything. However when you wrap the wire into a coil all the magnetic field lines line up and you have an electromagnet that is actually capable of lifting things. The largest of these kind of electromagnets are used in places where they need to lift lots of metal like scrap yards and stuff like that. And you can imagine that you could have one of these giant electromagnets and there would be a guy standing there with a switch and he'd be turning that switch on and off really fast trying to get something to levitate underneath the magnet and just watching how close to the magnet the object got. However, nobody is really that fast, and that's why we need to use electronics to control the system for us. Because electronics can think and respond faster than we can. So the problem with making a computer do this for us is that we need to give the computer eyes so that it can actually see how far away the thing we're levitating is from the thing that is doing the levitating. So it needs to know whether this is too low or this is too high. And subsequently turn on and off the magnet. So, I do this with a photogate. The uh, a photogate is they're used almost everywhere. Probably a really common example is a, uh, a garage door sensor, the, the little box on the side of your garage door that probably has a little light on it. One of those is actually emitting a beam of light, and the one on the other side is receiving it. So that if you walk through that beam and disrupt it, um, the garage door knows to stop closing and not to smush you. Uh, it's a lot like when people are trying to break into somewhere in movies and there's like lasers everywhere. That, that People actually use that for all kinds of stuff, not just for guarding things. But uh, you don't see it because it's infrared. Now, this setup uses uh, three infrared LEDs over here and one uh, infrared phototransistor on this side. And these will emit a beam of light that is picked up by this sensor and that lines up just far enough under here that when this thing comes up and blocks the beam it knows it's too close and when it falls down and lets the beam pass from one side to the other it uh, can tell in the circuit when the sensor hasn't what well, is picking up too much light and it says ah this thing must have fallen down so I'm going to turn the magnet back on okay so I've switched cameras now so that I can actually show you this beam because my laptop camera can actually see infrared where my phone camera can't that must mean that it's missing a filter somewhere. 
but if you want to determine if a camera can see infrared, all you've got to do is point a TV remote at it. And if it blinks like that, then it can see infrared, because if I'm just looking at that, I clearly don't see it blinking. My eye can't pick it up, but the computer can. Okay, so when you actually look at this thing with this camera, the, uh, the LEDs that emit the infrared beam are over here. So when I turn this on, they glow purple like that. And I'm not sure why the computer renders that as purple, but you can see that there's a light coming out there. And uh, it's picked up over here, and the beam will stretch right across. So this is actually the circuit that runs the levitator and regulates the strength of the magnet. But before I get to how this works, I need to really explain a transistor, because the phototransistor that senses the light, and then the transistors that drive the coil, are really the key parts of this circuit. So a uh, transistor, you can think of it as a switch. It can be on or off, or it can actually be partially on if you tweak it just right. And you can think of a transistor in, in three parts. The, uh, on one side there are a whole bunch of electrons that really are packed in and they are trying to get to the other side of the transistor. But if the switch is off you are preventing them from getting to the other side of the transistor because you're basically putting a barrier in the middle. Now electrons like to go uh, downhill but they don't like to go up. They don't want to climb that barrier. So the trick is that when you apply uh, a voltage to the middle lead, it pushes that barrier down. And uh, for the certain amount of current that goes through that middle lead, even more a, uh, a proportionally higher amount of current is allowed to pass straight from one side of the device to the other. And uh, this is what makes transistors really useful. Because if you have a certain amount of current flowing into this lead through the transistor, it means that a lot more current is being allowed to pass through the transistor this way. So in this case, you're actually taking a little bit of current and amplifying it, and then using that amplified current to again amplify and draw even more current through. And uh, this is actually the stage that drives the electromagnet. So based on how much current you're pumping in to this transistor, you amplify that current twice, so quite a bit, and then um, that is the current that is being pulled through the electromagnet. Now, uh, phototransistors are slightly different. Instead of applying current to the middle lead, you're actually applying light, and it works the same way. So for every photon that hits this, a certain number of electrons are, are allowed to pass from one side to the other. So the amount of light that hits this uh, will directly uh, lead to more current being allowed through. And if you do the math on this configuration right here, the amount of current that is going through this phototransistor uh, multiplied by, this, by the resistance of this resistor actually sets the voltage at this point. So uh, this is known as an, an emitter follower amplifier and it is the key to letting the circuit actually see um, where the floater is, because the more light you've got here, uh, you will have a higher voltage here, and you will be passing more current through the electromagnet and pulling the floater closer to the magnet. And the less light that you get over here, meaning that the floater is too close, actually means that there's less current flowing through here and less amplified current than flowing through the electromagnet. So when the floater gets too close, the magnet shuts down and it drops the floater back down. And this bit over here is just the infrared LEDs that I pointed out were on the other side of the photogate that actually send their light to the phototransistor. Okay, so now that I've explained how this thing works, I will show you uh, roughly how it was built. Uh, clearly the base is just wood, which is pretty darn simple. You cut it out and you put a screw through it to hold it together. But uh, for the more complicated shapes, especially all this stuff up top, uh, I got to use a 3D printer, which is one of the really cool parts about this project. Uh, at NC State, they actually, as of this past spring, have a uh, 3D printing service available to students, which is really awesome. So all of this, all the intricate shapes of the arc for the photo gate, I mean, you can even design like holes that perfectly fit LEDs and stuff like that. Uh, you design the whole thing in a CAD program, hit a button, and then you can go pick up. It's basically like pulling a part out of the screen. It's really awesome. But uh, 
the parts that then required a little more assembly were the coil, which I actually wound uh, with a drill, had to stretch it all the way down the dorm room hallway uh, while I was doing that. And there's a coil in that that actually, or the, uh, the core of that came out of the ignition coil of a lawnmower. It was the only stacked iron that I could find. But, uh, so this had to be then assembled. And all the circuitry at the top, actually, uh, there's very little of it here. <laughs> I took a couple shortcuts on the circuit. It's not a very nice circuit, but I wanted it to be able to fit in a small package. And all the wires, actually, that are for the photogate are encapsulated in here because I made these tubes hollow. It's another awesome thing about the 3D printer. So it can, it can hide all your wiring. And all of that basically bolts together at the top. Had to put a big heat sink on there because of some of the shortcuts I took in the circuit. And uh, the last item would probably be this fan that I ended at the, at the end just because it was cool. And what that does is basically keep the floater spinning the whole time so that it will stay there and the fan blows on it and make sure that this keeps spinning just because it looks cool. Adding to that physics desk toy appeal. Hey there, I hope that you enjoyed the video. I just wanted to point out that this is absolutely a try this at home project. Um, there are a handful of designs for levitators like this on the web. Some of them use more complicated circuits, some of them use uh, microprocessors, but um, if you want to build one of these, I would recommend, well, the, the scientific thing to do would be to look at all of the designs that are out there, figure out exactly what you want, and uh, understand how it works, and then start building. Now, um, the one bit of advice that I would give is to make it as adjustable as possible, because these things require a lot of tuning and tweaking. I had to adjust the, uh, the height of the photogate here. I had to adjust the resistor in the circuit uh, many times. And I actually, the last thing I changed was to round off the top of this just so that the beam would hit it right. So um, it, it will require some effort to get it working, but once it's working, it's really cool. So have fun and good luck.